Hi. Thanks for coming out, everyone. Um, this is one of our CPAC uh, presentations that Victoria Briggs, our district BCBA, and Jessica Smith, one of the school psychologists, is putting on for us. Um, it's going to be a lot of information about executive functioning, home, homework help. So hopefully everyone gets something out of it. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. Uh, so feel free to write, jot down your questions and uh, save them for the end. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, so we are here talking about executive functioning, and this right here pretty much sums me up. As long as everything is exactly the way I want it, I am totally flexible. And I think that you probably recognize that in a lot of your kids. You might recognize it in yourself, that we can be flexible when it's how we want it to be. Executive functioning, um, it's self-regulation. It's skills that depend on three different types of brain function, working memory, mental flexibility, and self-control. And they're all interrelated. They're all feeding off of each other pretty much all the time. And in order for them to be successful, they need to work together. There are the mental processes that help us to plan, focus, remember instructions, juggle multiple tasks. When you think about yourself being a master multitasker, you're using your executive functioning skills and you're really working hard to control all of those impulses. You're working to monitor your behavior, control your emotions, plan, organize all of that all at once. So here are basically the nuts and bolts of executive functioning and it's all of those skills. And I was telling Victoria earlier when we got here that I took a step back this afternoon when I got home from work and I was getting my kids ready, getting them off the bus, all of these different things, and I realized how much I take my executive functioning skills for granted and how much I was relying on time management to get not only myself ready to get here tonight, but to get my oldest son's homework done because he had to leave to go to a Minecraft class and how I had to make sure dinner was ready in time and all of these different things that when you take a step back, you realize you're really overtaxing your executive functioning skills at times, especially when you're multitasking and you might be answering work emails while making lunches for the next day while throwing in that load of laundry because somebody Somebody has pajama day and they ran out of clean pajamas. Meanwhile, you're setting notifications on your phone to remember to get the laundry out of the dryer and call your mother to thank her for the package she sent. So are you really tapping into all of these skills all at the same time? So think about how an, as an adult you're overutilizing these skills. And now think about your children having to use all of these skills. So basically, when you think about executive functioning, children aren't born with these skills already intact. They come from the frontal lobe, and it's really our job to help them begin to develop them. They begin developing in preschool, and they're on a continuum until early adulthood. So I tend to think of executive functioning skills as a work in progress. You might see some progress in some areas. You might see some regression in areas, because the brain is constantly developing these skills and figuring out how to make them all work together. So providing the support that your children need to build these skills Really, it's at home, it's at school, it's at all areas. And it's really, it's our most important responsibility. Children need the scaffolding of these skills to help practice them before they learn how to perform them independently. So what are the executive functioning skills? They're broken down into three different areas for us. There's behavioral regulation and emotional regulation. There's cognitive regulation as well. With the behavioral and emotional regulation, you've got that inhibit, self-monitor, shift, and emotional control piece. And then with that metacognitive or that cognitive regulation, you've got that initiation, working memory, planning and organizing, task monitor, and organization of materials. So inhibit. Basically, I tend to say that's layman's terms for lack of a filter. That's when your child is going to think something and immediately say it or do it. They're not going to think of any consequences or ramifications. It's really, that's when you think um, they're blurting out that comment that you really hope they're not going to say or they're going to take that risk as you're watching them and, and you're hoping, please don't do that, and they do it. And here's a nice little example of that. Just like that. <laughs> Boy, 
though he's a weird guy, isn't he? Hey. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Hey, 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 hey. Well, what are you doing? Yeah, Elaine, she has to leave her armoire on the street all night. I'm gonna guard it for her. You know, I need something to sit on. <laughs> well, I'll sit on one of your cushions. Yeah, but this is so nice and thick. We all know that child or adult. All right, thank you. It's shifting. And that's that, real, that being able to be flexible in your thinking, to recognize that there's different ways to problem solve, that we have to sometimes go with the flow when the routine changes, that, you know, maybe your favorite socks aren't available that day. Can we go with a backup? Really being able to shift seamlessly. So here's a little, exec, uh, little exercise in shifting your thinking. I want you to very quickly say what color the word is written in and not the word itself. So go through and see. You can even say it quietly and kind of mumble it to yourself and see if you can say the color the word is written in and not the word you read. It's really, really challenging. So for our kids who have trouble thinking flexibly and really being able to shift and go with changes in routine, that's what it feels like, where you, you know what you want to do and you just have a very hard time really being able to shift and be flexible. Emotional control keeping your feelings in check, really being able to manage and control your emotions. A lot of times, kids who have difficulty with emotional control will have a very big reaction to a very small problem. Here we go. All right, open. Hmm, this looks new. Think it's safe? What is it? Uh, okay, uh, caution. There is a dangerous smell, people. Hold on, what is that? This is disgust. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, physically and socially. That is not brightly colored or shaped like a dinosaur. Hold on, guys. It's broccoli! <laughs> yes! Well, I just saved our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're welcome. Riley, if you don't eat your dinner, you're not going to get any dessert. Wait, did he just say we couldn't have dessert? That's anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So that's how you want to play it, old man? No dessert? Oh, sure. We'll eat our dinner right after you eat this. Ah! Riley, ah! Honey, here comes an airplane. Ah! Oh. Airplane. We got an airplane, everybody. <gasps> airplane. I live that every day. <laughs> All right, so that next step, we're moving into more of those metacognitive or those cognitive regulation pieces. And we're talking about initiation of really being able to start a task knowing that you have to do homework, knowing that you have to clean your room, knowing that you have to get ready to go to soccer practice, of being able to initiate and take that first step to get started. So basically, starting a game, starting at go, wouldn't it be nice if we could collect $200 every time? The easiest thing is to react, second easiest is to respond, but the hardest thing is to start. And for kids who have difficulty with executive functioning and being able to initiate, that is really challenging for them. Working memory. That's holding on to information in your short-term memory, basically for the purpose of following a task or activity. That might be your morning routine. It might be your after-school routine. It might be your bedtime routine, where you feel like you're nagging your kids over and over again. I told you, get dressed, make your bed, brush your teeth. Get dressed, make your bed, brush your teeth. Why didn't you make your bed? because they're, they're not able to hold on to multiple steps of information in order to follow through with our tasks or act, our activities. Our working memory capacity is a lot greater than our kids' working memory capacity. So it's really helpful in those cases to break down the tasks, have them repeat it back until it becomes part of their routine. Some of us need a piece of paper and a pen to write down a phone number. Others can remember it. That's where a lot of those strategies come into play, especially with that working memory piece. You're probably all wondering why you walked into this room. <laughs> Planning and organizing. Deciding what you're going to do, making that plan to meet it. 
It could be sitting down to do a craft project. It could be making a plan for your day. It could be having a play date and planning and organizing. When you have your friend over, what are you going to do? And that can be very challenging for a lot of kids. Filtering out what's essential, what's non-essential. Are we all going to like what we're doing? Are we all going to be on the same page? And that's where a lot of, again, a lot of strategies come into play for planning. In the classroom, a lot of times you might see um, graphic organizers, you might see work contracts, you might see calendars, and that helps the students with all of their planning and organizing. Organization. That's a big challenge for a lot of kids, especially as they're progressing through the grades and they have multiple binders and they switch classes, they have lockers, they have Chromebooks. It's organizing not only your thoughts, but organizing your physical belongings. We all know those students who we open the backpack at the end of the day and everything but the kitchen sink is shoved in there in no apparent rhyme or reason. There's no order. We all know those kids. And they have a room that looks like that. And when you tell them to go and clean their room, that's a very monumental task for them because they're going to have trouble initiating or starting because in a room that looks like that, where do I even begin? That's me in the afternoons. <laughs> Monitor, that's that self-evaluation piece of really being able to take a step back and think, how is my performance, how is my behavior impacting not only myself, but everybody around me? I'm working in a group. Am I slowing everybody down because I'm over making jokes or I'm not keeping the pace with everybody? It's at home. Am I doing my homework? Am I bouncing out of my chair every five minutes to run and ask you a question and annoying my siblings sitting next to me? It's really your own perception of how you're doing. So on the, on the, the um, mixing up my left and right. On the right is how I think I look when I go running, but on the left it's more of that reality or how I think I look when I cry, but how I actually look. So it's really that perception. So how you can help or how we can help. We can facilitate the development of the executive functioning skills by establishing routines. Those are so incredibly important modeling good social behavior, and creating and maintaining supportive and reliable relationships. Children will also develop these executive functioning skills through creative play and social connections because it helps with that monitoring. It helps with that planning and organizing. It helps with that initiation and working memory. But then it also helps with a lot of those behavioral regulation pieces. Can I inhibit my impulses? Can I really control my emotions when my friend doesn't want to do what I want to do? And being able to work through those tough times. <laughs> School. It's challenging, demanding, and takes a whole lot of work. And it can be hard on your kids, too. Jeez, Brick, what do you got in here? This thing weighs a ton. Well, I told you. There's been a measurable increase in workload now that I'm in third grade. It's really cutting into my reading time. Okay, chicken nuggets, piles of popsicle sticks. Oh, an ant farm. I'm sorry, ant cemetery. You got a D on your math test? You don't get Ds. Eh, what are you gonna do? I'll tell you what you're gonna do, Brick. You're gonna study. Math is very important in life. You use math in everything. Oh, even I can't say it like I believe it. Hey. Hey, look at this, a D. Axel, get in here. This is Brick. Really? What happened, buddy? You don't get Ds. I'm gonna count on you to pull up the family average. I'm reading at an eighth grade level. Why can't I please you people? Just reading isn't going to get you into college. Well, I'm not going to college. I've decided to live with you guys forever. Forever. Well, Mike, you know what this means, don't you? Oh, jeez. We're going to have to help Rick with his homework. In our house, helping with homework is something that's never gone well. Write it down. <laughs> Write it down. Why aren't you writing it down? Just write whatever you want. I don't care. It's not my homework. It's your homework. Well, this time we're just going to have to make it fun. Write it down. Write it down. Why aren't you writing it down? That's not how Ms. Rinsky told us to do it. Well, how did she say to do it then? I don't know. You just write it down. We're supposed to show our work. You didn't do any work. I did. You should show her a picture of me. 
Are you sure there's not some other instructions that were sent home or something? Something you might have lost? Oh, yeah. You know what? There is. There's a big old pack of instructions with all the answers to everything we'd ever want to know, and I've been hiding it from you. Well, go get them! <laughs> Now we're going to move on to sort of what can we do, what strategies can we use in our home to create positive and consistent routines around executive functioning. I think the number one thing to do is always to keep in mind your child's preferences and interests when you're creating these routines. Have your child be part of creating these routines. If they don't have the buy-in for these routines, if they're not motivated to use these strategies, to use these visual supports, they're not going to use them. Have them help you make visual supports, and I'm going to show you some as we go through. Be consistent and create, and as well, and as well, don't be afraid to prompt your child. As Jessica said, this is a continuum. This is a spectrum, and kids are going to need prompts for a long time before these routines become more internalized. And as well, help them initiate. Again, that's the, that's the last prompt you're ever going to fade away. You're, helping them get started is the hardest part. So you know, really helping kids get started will benefit the rest of um, these home routines. All right, so some examples of some organizational supports around homework <coughs> is um, it's stressing the compliance with the routines. When Justin and I were talking about this, um, presentation. We we're talking about not only is homework meant to practice the skill that the students have been assigned or the students have been work, working on. It's also to work on these executive functioning routines, these routines within the home. So stressing with your child that going through the routine, going through the motions of homework is just as important as the actual math problems themselves. You know, that working on that being more independent. So you can see that this is just a different, a couple different ways that you could break down homework in just a very simple first then. Nothing I'm going to show you is going to be crazy, you know, out there. It, we want to show you things that you can easily do in your own home. So again, the first one is just do your your homework then play video games so a lot of kids that would work but for some kids they might need it broken down even further where they would do their math only numbers one to five have a snack do the rest of their math and then have a choice to do whatever they wanted and for some other students starting with a very preferred activity or a moderately preferred activity sets the stage for having just being in a good mood and and having a positive positive attitude so sometimes starting with a snack or watching 10 minutes of TV or watching a, sh a short show and then starting the homework and then going back to free time. So you're sort of sandwiching those more non-preferred activities in there. Um, so again, incorporating reinforcing and high probability behaviors into home routines is something that is has been researched a lot with kids and adults with anxiety and depression. but can work for all kids, right? If we incorporate things that we like to do with things that we don't like to do, we're more likely to do the things we don't like to do. So this is an example that was used with um, um, uh, someone with some severe anxiety who was not wanting to go to school. So they had a routine set up with a visual support that just was get up, watch TV. So we're go getting up, which is the hard thing, then we're going to watch TV, which is a fun, preferred thing. Get ready eat breakfast, eating breakfast is pretty preferred, go to school, I go to school, I come home, and I play video games. And then you can incorporate something like, if I do this for two days, then I get to play basketball with a friend. You can up that to three days, four days, once a week, on Fridays you go out for ice cream, whatever it is, but it's all sort of about sandwiching those reinforcing activities with those non-preferred activities. So the next slide just shows you the visual of an app called um, ChoiceWorks. Um, this is a pretty inexpensive app that you can put on a phone, an iPad. Um, it's, I think, under $20. And you can enter in any routine you want. This is using the clip art that they give you, but you can e very easily take photos of whatever you want to do for the, for the student's routine. You can also, as you can see at the top, add a timer in. So if you want your child to only be doing something for a certain amount of time, I can't see because of the glare what the first thing on this routine is. But um, for instance, if you want them to brush their teeth for two minutes, they would press brush their teeth, then they would start the timer, the timer would auditorily go off, and the student could slide it over to the all done. 
It also has auditory prompts in it too. So you can have your child record their own voice saying all the steps. You could record your voice or you could use the computer generated voice. And then you add in a reinforcer in the bottom. But again, it gives you 100% flexibility that if you wanted to incorporate those reinforcing activities into the routine throughout, that's fine too. Um, so this is just a really easy app to use and this is also something that you could easily do on paper as I showed you with using just a simple whiteboard but sometimes kids are more motivated by technology so and they could be really motivated to make the schedule by going around the house and taking pictures of you know oh I'm going to take a picture of my my own toothbrush I'm going to take a picture of you know my own hairbrush and whatnot so All right, so here's some examples of having a weekly schedule. And the first one, so you can click on those links. So the first one actually was created by um, Jessica. <laughs> and you actually have a copy of that. So there is copies of that out, so you can take one. Um, but you can use this um, sheet to plan out your week with your child. So again, priorities, things you always do every week. So that might be things like, I always have soccer practice, I always have dance, something like that. Other things I must do this week, what things are um, maybe due for school, what maybe I have a dentist appointment that week, and optional things. So things, and I really like this part too, because you're incorporating the child and things they might want to do, like, um, you know, the new season of Star Wars, The Clone Wars starts this week, so I really want to be able to watch it. So you're putting their thoughts into it as well. And then here's a nice little visual where you can sort of write down where things are going to happen. And then on the last, on the second page, I think you have, yeah, there's one more, yeah. So then there's just sort of steps here as to how to do that. So you guys have that to take home with you. And then this is just a sample of a weekly schedule that um, we use for students in school. But I've actually, this is an example of one that um, I've used for students in school, but this is something you could easily do for home and that I've sort of helped parents to adapt to use for home and it just sort of breaks down the day and even though it looks like a lot visually this is for a kindergartner and they really like going through their schedule and seeing and it helps to teach and reinforce reading and things like that and teaching time elapsed time how long things take all those skills that Jessica talked about before it's helping to synthesize them together using a visual aid so this is something that you can easily make for home oh you can just So planning. We have to plan all the time. Like Jessica was talking about, she had to plan today, you know, how, when she was picking up her son and dropping off and doing the laundry and all those things. Our children have to plan all the time. And sometimes it's something that we really wish that they would be a little more independent with because even simple tasks or simple routines, it's hard for them to plan. So there's two types of planning. Um, I'm going to talk more about backward planning because I think it works better for our students, but um, forward planning is a process of sort of making, pl making plans to take into account what is likely to happen or needed to happen in the future. So you're starting with today and moving forward to an outcome. Backward planning means that you first identify your goal. So you first identify, I talked to a parent about this, identifying here's the first day of college, you know, for a senior. And here's the first day of college. We identify that on the calendar. And then we work backwards through all the events and all the steps and all the things that need to happen between now and then. Um, so you're going to make that action plan. Some tips were identifying the end date, working from the goal and then each preceding step, emphasizing the process versus the outcome, which is another reason why I really like backward planning because, again, we're really emphasizing practicing those executive functioning skills, which is focusing on that process, not just focusing on start and end. And ensuring details are not ignored. Again, a lot of our students have trouble with details. So we're making sure that we get all those details. And it avoids procrastination because you're assigning dates to specific things. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. Um, so provide leading when you're starting. Um, doing backward planning, you want to provide leading, leading questions. You don't want to say to your child, 
this is what we're, you know, you have a book report due on March 20th, and you need to write a summary, and you need to research the characters, and you need to um, revise it, and you need to type it. You want to provide those leading questions, so really to encourage that independence. By, al by allowing your child to have to sort of process that with you, you're practicing all those metacognitive pro um, processes with them. So how should we get started? What comes first? What order should we do this in? So you're providing leading questions. You might actually write out all the steps on a piece of paper and say, which one of these should we do first? Um, you're, so you're allowing the child to have more independence and more ownership over the project, over the goal, over whatever you're working towards. So then here's one example of someone who did color coding, which was very cool. Um, so they had their exams that they had to take, and they wrote down the assignments that they needed to do or chapters they needed to read leading up to the exams in different coordinating colors. So that's just an example of where they identified the exams, then they went backwards and filled in all the assignments that they needed to do leading up to them. Here's another um, Another little visual, so it talks, it has the date of the test that's coming up, the topic, and all the action items, and the nice thing is the time needed. So again, with that planning, organizing, monitoring piece, our students have a, lot, a hard time estimating how long things are gonna take. So if you sit with them and you make this plan of action, you can say, okay, creating a study guide. Let's really think realistically how long that is gonna take and then you can assign that amount of time. And also, it makes it look less daunting when you see this open-ended thing, create a study guide. A lot of kids with anxiety or um, difficulty with executive functioning look at that as this open-ended task, like this is gonna take me three weeks and I'm never gonna get it done, so I'm not gonna get it started. Whereas four hours and I'm gonna do it on day four doesn't really look that intimidating. So giving examples to kids for what things should look like is really helpful. Um, it's a strategy that comes from Sarah Ward, who's an executive functioning guru, and she just talks about giving kids actual photographs of how you want things to look in your home, in the school setting. Um, teachers do this a lot with what your desk should look like in the morning, and that's projected on the board. What the inside of your desk should look like every day. Um, what the inside of a locker should look like. What should be in your binder. So you can use that easily in the home setting. Like, what should be in your backpack every day? What does that clean room look like? That messy room that Josh showed you before, maybe that's what it looks like when it's clean. So instead of telling the child to here, just clean your room, you can have a picture of this is what we're gonna make your room look like. Help them initiate, help them get started, tell them I'll be back in 10 minutes to check on you and um, go from there again this is what I want the four year to look like when you come in from school your boots are here your coat is here instead of strewn everywhere so and I just added the picture of you know what you should look like when you go to school or a job interview or whatever you may be working on so transitions and shifting this is a really hard one for a lot of our students. So I pulled some strategies that I really like to use from Jessica Minahan, who's a local behavior analyst, but um, is an author as well. I'm sure many of you have heard from her. So breaking down what is a transition, you think, you're just going from one place to another. That's so easy. When you think about us, we make millions of transitions during our day. We go to lunch, we go to the bathroom, we brush our teeth, we do all these things. We transition from one place to another. But when you break down all the steps, it's almost like, oh my gosh, I do all these things. So I have to stop what I'm doing. I have to shift to the next activity. I have to start the next activity. And I possibly could have some downtime in between then in which my brain might start thinking about something else. So for instance, th think of a student or your child who is playing video games and they have to go brush their teeth. So they have to stop the video game, which is really fun, and they have to think, okay, now I have to go to the bathroom, I have to find my toothbrush, I have to find the toothpaste, and I have to brush my teeth. They have to start that next activity, and they might have some wait time. I think, you know, we, we end up with wait time a little bit more in the school setting than in the home setting, but sometimes it might be like, get ready for soccer, and then you might have five minutes in between or something like that, where you might have this downtime to fill. So some strategies for transitions. 
Practice, practice, practice. Um, so using visual schedules is great to break down the routines. That's a good thing. Providing explicit prompts and limits, using those visual or auditory timers, and again, using your kids' preferences. Some kids abs that I know absolutely hate timers. They hate them. So you don't use them. You don't, and, and you know, parents will say to me, but the, I'm told timers really work. And they do work great for some kids, but they work horribly for other kids. So it's just sort of knowing your time. Don't provide excessive extra minutes. So set a limit around how much extra time you allow your child to have. So let's say, um, you know, the TV goes off at 8 o'clock and your child's like, come on, can I just have a little more time? Set a rule around your house that you can always ask for five more minutes and then that's done. Um, the prompt finding a stopping place is a really great one, especially for kids when they're playing a game playing with toys or reading or doing anything where, you know, if, think about when you're reading a really good book. Do you want to stop in the middle of the chapter? No, you don't. Are you watching a really good TV show? Do You don't want to stop before the end. So if you can teach your child to find a good place to end or stop and identify that time and then say, okay, that's where we're going to stop today, and then you've, you've sort of helped them already set up to make that cognitive shift and encouraging those routines and independence. So every time that the iPad might be all done, it gets turned off and put back in its spot. So it just gives the child that intermediary activity to start to shift their brain, and it's kind of nice to put something away at something physical. Um, so it, it just encourages those positive routines. So again, providing prompts to initiate. Like we keep saying, getting started is the hardest part. So if you need to help your child get started, that is okay, if, especially if it's gonna help them successfully finish the task or routine you want them to finish. You can also provide a transitional activity. Again, it's really hard to go from playing video games to doing your homework. So a lot of times what we do in the school setting is we do a medium preferred activity or a neutrally preferred activity. So instead of going from video games, which is my favorite thing ever, to homework, I could go to video games to snack, which is medium preferred, to homework. So it makes it a lot easier for me to shift from one thing to another. Um, with kids in the community, I've um, talked with parents before, kids who hate running errands and you have to go a million places today, sandwich in some fun things that they like to do. So we're going to go to the bank and then we're going to stop at Dunkin' Donuts and then we're going to go grocery shopping. So again, it's making, sort, adding in those preferred activities to make those transitions easier. Um, the last one is teaching and reinforcing waiting skills. And I think this is something that I, I as a teacher and as a behavioral analyst, forget also. It's re we all have to wait in our lives a lot. And some of our students don't have the skills to wait. It's, it's really anxiety provoking. It's, really, it's just really scary and hard. And there's nothing to do. And maybe I'm getting to something really fun and it's really hard to wait. So it's an essential life skill. So you can practice waiting and then provide that positive reinforcement, like such as, you know, reading a bedtime story and saying, oh, I'm going to go brush my teeth, so I'll be back in two minutes, and then to read your bedtime story. And then if the, your child waits nicely and it doesn't, you know, start playing or get into, you know, doing something that you don't want them to do, then maybe you read them two bedtime stories and get really excited that they waited. Um, so again, teaching your child to occupy their waiting time. So this is a really interesting one, and I was thinking a lot about this. Like, what do we do when we're sitting in a waiting room? We read a magazine. We might think about all the things we have to do. We might go on our phone and check our email. When we're in line, we might read the magazine that's, you know, um, in the checkout line. We might um, look through our list to make sure we got everything. But we have ways to occupy our waiting time that don't cause anxiety, that sort of allow us to cope and move through our day. So teaching your child how to occupy their waiting time it might not be a skill that comes to them intrinsically. It might not be a skill that they just know right away like we think we did, because again, J Jess said, this is a, something that has developed over time. So teaching your child, like humming a song, or looking at a book, or having something in their pocket, like a fidget that they can play with, teaching kids to something to do while they're waiting, practicing it at home first can be really helpful across a, vari across a variety of settings. So now we can go to questions. Thank you for listening to us. 
Yeah, yeah. So does anyone have any questions for us? My son, um, he had had ABA come into the home, um, and they worked with the routine. So we have written routines for the morning, and that's getting up. It broke it all the way down to the time even, like 7 to 7 02, mm -hmm. seven, you know, all that. And then at the end, he got a gratification. If he was able to make it through, he had computer time. Mm -hmm. I'm finding that <laughs> he's turning off the clock and he's just sitting there. And so I'll knock on his door and he, he's like, I'm up. And then I'll be in the bathroom, I'll turn around, he's still sitting there in his own little world. <laughs> So it's hard to kind of get him going through, even when he can read it on his wall, what he's supposed to break down to do, we don't kind of go forward. Um, he even has a routine for home when we come from school, taking stuff out of his bag, then he has a snack, then he does his homework because we've tried the reverse. And right. <laughs> you can't take him away from electronics. Mm -hmm. So what do you do when you have that kind of visual? but we can't go, we can't accomplish. So I'll answer first and then I'll hand it to you. But what I would say is maybe start fresh, remake the visual and have your son help you make it. You know, ha let him sort of help you type it or pick out pictures or whatever you want and try possibly sandwiching in some of those more neutrally or um, medium preferred activities. So maybe after he, you know, does two of the things that he needs to do, he gets to read a book for a few minutes. Or maybe you check in with him more often and just sort of give him more that verbal praise for following it through. Because when kids are motivated to shift from one thing to another because he sees that big reward in the end, it really may help. Um, you know, it might motivate him to sort of move through the routine like, oh, I did two things, I get something fun. Oh, I did three more things, now I get something really fun. So he sort of knows in the end that's when that big reward is coming. But I'm also going to let Jess... Uh, you, okay. <laughs> and also, saying, um, yep, yep. and I think trying to get him more invested in his routine, like helping him, like, should we do things in a little bit of a different order? You know, take the routine apart, cut it all up and say, do you think maybe we should do eat breakfast before you get dressed? What do you want? You know, and the more kids are involved, the more kids own what they're doing, I find that they're just more successful because they have that buy-in, you know, so hope that helps a little <laughs> and it is unfortunately you know there's so many strategies out there there's more than I showed you I picked my favorite ones but a lot of it is trial and error like I said every kid is so individual every kid is so different so you have to try and see what works for your child and what doesn't work and you know you will find what works eventually but unfortunately sometimes we have some failures along the way but that's okay <laughs> Thank you guys very, very much for coming.